More details have come out about the firing of Scott Service. And spoiler alert, they don't make the organization look very good. Plus, why things may get very financially tricky for the Mariners next year. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast. Mariners Madness with Rob Guerrera. The pitch from Acevedo. A drive feet to right field. Down the line. The Mariners win this game 2-1. to one. The dream lives. They're going to the playoffs. The drought is over. The sickest Seattle Mariners podcast. It's going to be sick. What is good, everybody? Welcome to another Mariners Madness podcast on the Sick Podcast Network. I'm your host, Rob Stats Guerrero. <sighs> September is going to be a long, long month. Before we get into everything, please rate, review, and follow the Mariners Madness podcast wherever you get your audio pods. Like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're here every Tuesday and Thursday for you. Look, the more we have found out about Scott Service and how that firing went down, the less good the Mariners look. And I heard something yesterday that really made me wonder what the hell is going to happen this offseason. First, I'll just touch on it briefly because they did play a game last night. The Mariners actually hit the ball, believe it or not. 16-3, to they beat the Oakland A's, a rarity. And they actually picked up a game on the Houston Astros because for the one time in what feels like forever, the Mariners actually won a game when the Astros lost. So Seattle's at 70 and 70 on the year, five and a half games back of Houston in the American League West. I heard a crazy stat on the Locked On Mariners podcast that I could not believe as the Mariners have a chance to even the series against the A's with a win tonight, but can't win it. And of course, that series is in Oakland. This entire season, the Mariners have won six road series the whole year they have won six one of those by the way was a two-game series against the Padres and the other was against the White Sox that is really depressing that really you know I talked about the home road splits last week or uh, excuse me on Tuesday six road series wins all season long what is going on when they leave T-Mobile? And I know it's a it's a pitcher's park, but that doesn't explain all of this. I mean, that is just bad. Is that a is that a clubhouse thing? Is that a leadership thing? What is the deal there? But that's too bad to be coincidental, right? It's too bad to just be, well, that's baseball. Like, no, baseball is random. That's not random, right? That's consistent poor play. So I gotta wonder. That is. That really made me kind of look side eye at this year's squad. Like maybe it's one thing to be bad, right? If you're just trying your best and you're not that good, like that's what happens. But it, it almost makes me feel like there's something else going on. Like something is not right in that clubhouse when they go on the road, at least. Maybe it's a focus issue. I don't know. But again, baseball is random. This is not random. Six road series wins all year. And one of those is a two-game series, and one is against the White Sox that have lost 109 games this year with a whole month of the season to go. That's bad. That is definitely, definitely bad. Um, and for the for the Mariners, like I said, they can't win. They can split the series with the A's. Then they go on the road to St. Louis. They still have road series against Texas and Houston the rest of the way. And we're past the point of saying, hey, the Mariners are playing bad teams. Because guess what? The Mariners are the bad team. They are the they are the team that other people look at and be like, hey, we, we could put something together. We got to play the Mariners. We could sweep them. That's what other people are saying about Seattle. So I'm done saying that. I was totally wrong about that. Clearly, I was totally wrong about that. So I just did, I did want to touch on that um, because it was an on-the-field thing. And I know I said I'm not going to talk about too much on the field. But it, when I heard that, I was absolutely stunned. The other thing that I heard on the field, um, and this sort of came up when they played the Rays with Randy Arozarena hanging out and going to the Rays clubhouse and hanging out with them. And just the way you see him on the field this week, I mean, he's not hustling at times. 
at times at the plate, he really just looks like he wants to be anywhere. Like I'll just swing at three pitches. And if I hit the ball and get on base, great. If I hit the ball and get out, great. But at least I won't be at the plate anymore. He, he doesn't really look like he's all in or wants to be in Seattle at all. And look, I can't say I blame him, right? Like, first of all, he was traded there during the season. He had no control over that. So it's not like, well, he chose to sign in free agency and now he's having remorse. No, like he he never chose to come to Seattle. He had no choice to come to Seattle. I get that. I get his family, I believe, is still in Florida. So that's obviously a very difficult situation. That sucks, frankly, as a father of two. I, you know, don't love the idea of being all the way across the country from my family. That's not ideal. But also, like, what has Seattle done that would make him want to be here? Right? Like the team is terrible. They're basically depending on him to be their entire offense. So he's got immense pressure on him. The ownership stinks. The vibes in the clubhouse are off. They just replaced their manager. Like what exactly is attractive about Seattle? You can't hit there, right? It's a terrible place to hit. So you got all this offensive pressure on you and and you're playing in a stadium that basically is where hitters go to die. So I get it if Randy Arozarena is not all in. Now that doesn't excuse not hustling. You're still getting paid millions of dollars. You need to be a professional, which you're supposed to be, and hustle. That's the one thing that should never change. But just the whole idea that like, does he really want to be here? Like, no, I don't get it. And the problem is he's going to be there next year, or I should say he's under contract. So I'll talk a, b- a little bit more about that later. Um, it's going to come up as I talk about the future of this organization. Regarding Scott Service and that whole situation, I heard Ryan Divish with Jason Puckett on his podcast, which is excellent, by the way. You should definitely go and listen to that. Not now. This is our time. But Divish said through his sources, that Jerry DePoto, from what he could piece together, was not the source of the leak about Scott Service, which, of course, caused Scott Service to find out he was fired via social media instead of a phone call from Jerry DePoto. Divish said he heard it was somebody in the ownership group, which more than likely, he didn't, Divish didn't say this, but Puckett kind of put it together on the podcast, probably means John Stanton, which is just unreal like just shows such a lack of professionalism and just seriousness right it that is such a weak ass move if john stanton the owner of the team leaked it to ken rosenthal like have a little a little class it just shows somebody that's never really been in that situation themselves and has no sense of how they would want to be treated just just divorced from professionalism and frankly let's be honest courteousness right like politeness so if that's true and i have no reason to doubt ryan divish that is just an ugly ugly scenario for the mariners and again like we talk about attracting people and why people would want to be here like i keep saying it the fish stinks from the head man Ownership on down. It's just unprofessional, unserious, every step of the way. It's not surprising, right? Like, that's what happens when your leadership is poor. Attitude reflects leadership to go remember the Titans on you, quite frankly. So if that's true, that was just sad and depressing. But the other thing that they kind of pointed out, and I hadn't put this together yet, and that's my fault, so I'm glad that they did, is... Next year's prospects are looking a little bleak. And by a little, I mean a lot. (laughs) Basically, the team that has no money or refuses to spend their money more accurately is about to get a lot more expensive because of arbitration and guys entering their arbitration years. For example, Logan Gilbert going into arbitration years. Cal Raleigh, George Kirby, Miller, Arosa Reina, all going into... And if arbitration, for anyone that doesn't know, is basically the team proposes a salary to pay a player. The player goes through, and both sides really do this. What they do is they go through baseball and they try to find a comparable player. And they say, hey, we're going to pay you this salary because that's what this guy that did similar things makes. And the Mariner, the team always picks a low salary, obviously. The player and his agent always pick a high salary and a comp. 
that favors the player for somebody that makes a lot of money. And then an arbitrator picks which one wins. There's no middle ground, right? Which one or the other who makes the better case and then bam. Well, here's the thing. All those guys that I just named are really good players. So they're probably more than likely going to win their arbitration cases, which means their salary is going to be a lot more expensive. So Logan Gilbert, next three years, arbitration. He's probably going to go from making like four, four and a half million to somewhere around $9 million. Cal Raleigh made like 700, like 800 grand this year. He's got the fourth most home runs of any catcher in his first four years in, in, no, excuse me. I think he's got the second most home runs of any catcher in his first four years in the history of Major League Baseball. Think he's going to get a raise? George Kirby, he'll probably go up to about $4 million. I know he's really kind of had a rough end of the year, but still obviously deserves way more than he's making. Bryce Miller is going to be super too, so he's going to have four years of arbitration coming up. Randy Rosarena is probably going to make more money in arbitration. Divish said between from like he could go from like nine to twelve million dollars. Plus, you factor in the other contracts that they have on the books, right? Mitch Garver, twelve and a half million. Mitch Hanniger is going to make sixteen million dollars next year. Ugh, sixteen million. Guy can't even play every day. Julio's contract uh, naturally escalates next year to around nineteen twenty million dollars. JP Crawford is going to make 11 million next year and 12 million the year after that. And of course, Luis Castillo is going to make $72 million over the next three years. The point being, this team never spends money, but they are going to be forced to spend a lot more money unless they trade everybody, which I highly doubt they would do that. They may trade one or two to, to try and tamp down costs, though. Don't be shocked if that happens. But the point is, this team that doesn't want to spend any money is going to be forced largely to spend a lot more money on the same players. And they're not going to get any better, right? Because it's it's the same guys. So then do you think on top of that, they're going to go out and make a bunch of free agent signings and spend even more money? Hell no. Hell no. So when you look at the prospects for next year, as we're supposed to do, you say, what can be different, right? Like, all right, this year was a, a lost cause, right? Disaster of a year, whatever. Let's hope springs eternal. Let's look to 2025. And it's like, well, guess what? It's it's going to be the same dudes, really. And you could say, well, everyone had a down year. They can't have two of those years in a row. You want to make that bet? You really want to make a bet on the Mariners not to continue to find a way to lose? I think history has shown that's a losing bet. You might as well just flush your money down the toilet. And what I think you're going to hear when we're talking about 2025, frankly, especially if Jerry DePoto remains the general manager, which maybe he will, maybe he won't. But especially if Jerry DePoto remains the general manager, what are you going to hear? You're going to hear about the same thing that you always hear about from the Mariners when the major league team struggles. Just wait till these prospects that we have get to the major leagues. Just hold on. Just be patient. We need your patience. We got a whole group of young prospects coming and that's when we're really going to take off. And that's when you can judge us. Just, we got a whole bunch of prospects and you may be like, well, prospects like who, right? Whole bunch of prospects like Steve Barron and Jeff Clement and Evan White and Dustin Ackley. And Austin Jackson, just wait for those guys to come. Nick Franklin, he's really, oh, no, wait, I'm sorry. Those aren't current Mariners prospects. That's a list of bums that they were giving me three, four, five, six, seven years ago. Right? I've seen this movie before. I have seen, so I don't want to hear about Henry Ford and Cole Young and Johnny Farmello and Colt Emerson. I don't want to hear about that. I have heard it before. And I don't care how good they're doing in the minors. I don't care how many home runs Montez hits in the minors. I'm I don't want to hear about that. I don't. I have been sold that bill of goods before. And it's bullshit. And it always has been. The minor league prospects. It's such a con with this team. Oh, the major league team stinks. Look at the prospects. Now, if Jerry DePoto is gone, they won't really have that line of thinking. They might mention it, but they're not going to hang their head on it because those aren't their guys, right? You hire a new general manager. He didn't draft or he or she didn't draft any of those guys. 
So they're not really going to hang their hat on that. They're going to sell you. If that happens, they'll sell you on a, a new vision, new philosophy, a new player development system, all of that stuff. That will be the, the selling point there. New voice, right? We're going to out with the old, in with the new. That'll be the tagline, so to speak. But if it's DePoto staying, which all of Jerry DePoto's actions seem to indicate to me that he's a guy that at least thinks that he's staying, then that's what you're going to hear, which is unbelievable, right? Because he has shown in nine years he can't develop any offensive stars, really. It's been proven over and over again. But that's the philosophy that you will hear. That's the tagline that you will hear. Just wait until these guys, just wait. It's always the Mariners. Just wait. Sure, we never made a World Series in almost 50 years of playing baseball, but just wait. It's coming. Yeah, it's coming. All right. So I don't want to be a complete bummer and a total downer. I know there's not a lot of good going on right now with the Mariners, but I was trying to think like, okay, how can I at least provide something positive for the end of the show? And I was thinking like, all right, what, what are things that the Mariners could do that at least would make you feel better about the team and the team's direction next season? And I came up with a few things, three things, really. First and foremost, clear out guys that aren't on board. Like if you think Randy or Rosarena doesn't want to be here, get him out, trade him. Now, I'm not saying like Logan Gilbert and all those guys who may be a little dissatisfied. I'm saying like kind of these fringe guys that you have added, get them out. Because you need everybody pulling in the same direction. You don't want any seeds of doubt in the clubhouse or anything like that. So, Randy or Rosarena, you don't want to be here? Great. No problem. We'll trade you. We'll take what we can get, and we'll move on. You need a united, upbeat, positive clubhouse. So, he's got to go. It's going to be tough enough to build that as it is with the guys you have to keep. So, Randy or Rosarena can get you something in the offseason. So, I, I think that's a move you have to make. Number two, fix the batter's eye, right? And, and again, I, I I don't think this is a huge deal. I don't think it's like all of a sudden now everybody's going to start hitting 35 home runs for the Mariners. I really don't. I don't even know if it's really a thing, but I think what is clear is that the players think it's a thing, right? The players think that there's something to it. You know, it's like all those hotels you hear about on the road that people think are haunted, right? They're not really haunted because that's not a thing. But if players think it is and people think it is, then essentially it is. It becomes that, right? And so if you have this perception with T-Mobile that there's something funky with the batter's eye and that's stopping a hitter from being good, you have to do something to try and change that. Change the way it looks. Change the angle. Come up whatever BS you have to sell, but you need to do something to make people think that something's going to be different. Because you don't want the Mariners in their head to be like, ah, you know, this damn batter's eye. It's such, it's so terrible. You know, if they're struggling, they could just blame it on the batters. Like, you got to get rid of that. And you got to get rid of that for the perception of people that you're trying to get from the outside. And that's a huge part of it is you have so much bad word of mouth now that you have to do things to combat that. So the batters, and the batters, I think, like, you may not really reap the benefits of that for a couple years down the road. Cause you may change it and people on the outside may say like, ah, whatever, this is bogus. But then if you change it and all of a sudden you start to hit better at T-Mobile, even a little bit, I feel like all of a sudden that can take hold, right? Like, Hey, you know what? I heard it's bad, but then they change the batter's eye. All of a sudden, you know, they look better. So maybe they fix that. So that again, perception is reality. How much does it actually matter? I don't know, but you got to do things to change the perception. You have to, which is why, as we get to my third thing now, you have to change general manager. You have to change, just sweep through this front office. And I apologize. I don't, I don't take any joy in calling for people's jobs. I've been laid off multiple times in my career. I know what that's like. That's scary and it's terrible. But I'm I'm putting that as I'm just saying purely from a from a fan perspective here. You have to just forest fire the front office like you need it. You need to burn everything down so that new growth can happen, just like a forest fire. Have to do it. You have to get the Poto out of there. You have to get Hollander out of there. You have to get everybody out of there and you have to replace replace them with completely new people, whole new regime. You have to. Again, you've got to get rid of the bad word of mouth. It's been almost a decade now, but Jerry DePoto has built up 
a bad reputation, frankly, within the game. And not only a bad reputation, but just people just don't like him. They don't like the arrogance that he sometimes has. They don't like the way he thinks that like he's got it all figured out. It, you just got to get guys don't want to play for people like that. Got to get rid of it. Have to. Right out. Dan Wilson, too. Love you, Dan. I don't care. We said you're not the interim manager. What, get out. Edgar, thanks for everything, Edgar. Get out. Everybody. Everybody. Then you got to go into 2025. You got to say, we got a new regime. We got a new regime that knows how to find some goddamn offense. We've got a new regime that's going to work with the pitching foundation that we have that Jerry DePoto provided because, let's be honest, he did. Much as you want to criticize him, let's give him credit where credit's due. They they do have a good pitching development program, and it's led to a very, very good rotation, even if there are some questions about them on the road. And your message has to be, we're on our way now. The major league club, the major league club is on our way. We've figured out our mistakes. We self-scouted. We changed the batter's eye. We changed our hitting philosophy. We've gotten rid of the bad seeds in the clubhouse. And we're going to get after it. And we're going to replay. And they have to make some changes to the roster. Like Jorge Polanco, for example, has an option for next season. Get him out. Like, nope, can't be back. Get rid of him. If a Rosarena doesn't want to be there, you trade him. And you got to get pieces back. And pieces that that are a different style of hitter than, than the style you've gotten. You know, one of the things I heard Divish say the other day with, with Jason Puckett is like, the team is not athletic, right? Like, who is the most athletic person on the team right now? It's maybe Julio when he's hundred percent, but other than that, like there aren't a lot of just flat out good athletes on the team anymore. You can change that in the off season. You can change it and they need to change it because if they don't, what are they telling you for next year? They're telling you just same old, like we're going to run it back and hope. How many times do I say hope is not a strategy? Those are all things that they could do. Will they do all of them? I think they'll maybe do some. I think the batter's eye will be a thing. It's an easy thing, right? It's a tangible thing that they can point to that probably doesn't cost ownership that much money. And they could say, look, we're trying. See, you know, they love, they love to be able to make a show of how much they're trying. So that could be a real thing. The Rose Arena thing. I don't think they care if he wants to be there. I don't think Jerry DePoto cares, frankly. Um, which is kind of amazing because he was a player himself. But I think that will come down to flat out what they can get in return. If Jerry can get a decent return, I think he would have no problem. We know Jerry likes the trade. So so we will see. Thankfully, the Mariners have two more road series, so at least we won't have to endure that. Or three more, actually. I forgot about the St. Louis. St. Louis, Texas, and Houston. So at least we could see them look somewhat like the best version of themselves since most of their remaining games will be at home. Again, I still don't think they're catching the Astros. I think that much is pretty clear by now. Five and a half games back. Houston is just a really good team. <laughs> they just have a really good team with a really good roster. And the Mariners have blown every chance that they have had this season to try and seize a playoff spot. They blew the division lead. Even the past few weeks, they could have made a real run in the wild card. Kansas City's kind of struggled. They're three and seven in their last 10, right? They have the last wild card spot right now. Boston has struggled. They're also three and seven in their last 10. You had an opportunity to make a move again. And once again, the Mariners have shown that they are not willing to seize those opportunities. They let them pass by like a runner on third with less than two outs. So we wait. And I hope we get news one way or the other, honestly, about the future of Jerry DePoto. Like, we. Why do we why do we need to wait until the end of the season? That seems weird to me, but if they don't change it, it's going to be real hard to get excited about 2025. That's going to do it for this edition of Mariners Madness. Please rate, review, and follow the Sick Podcast Network and all the podcasts we have at the Sick Podcast Network. I'm Rob Stats Carrera. Hit me up on all the socials at Stats on Fire. DMs are open. Have a good Thursday. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the sick podcast Mariner's Madness with Rob Guerrera on YouTube, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.